Where we left off, we were talking about vector fields. And so we have some uh, so I have some F from R in R and this can give us a gradient vector field. <laughs> Rad F, which is from Rn to Rn, right? So I talked about this a little bit, and um, I guess I didn't really prove this, so I don't know. Maybe it's obvious. So so let's so imagine that we have some. I'm going to compare these two. Actually, let me just put that aside. So, so I want to show that the gradient, not verb, how about, let's call it theorem. So the gradient of F is perpendicular to Gibbs. S, where S is a level set, Or, or F. <coughs> so, so if we're talking about R2, I guess what do I need here? I guess I need, this is if, so provided that gradient of F is not zero at some point X naught, and Uh, and also that F is continuously differential. Right? That's what I want. So, so in, in, the, in the case... Wait, what's F X to what? <laughs> what? This F, delta, I'm sorry. Uh, so, X of what? Sorry, sub what? F of X. No, F of what? No, uh, the, oh, I mean next to the perpendicular symbol. So it's perpendicular to a level set S, which contains <coughs> oh, X naught. So I just couldn't read yeah. that was. So, so what I'm saying is, so let me draw a picture. So suppose that we have, I don't know, F is X squared plus Y squared. For the easy example, now let's put a two here. So, so f is 4x squared plus y squared, which is, uh, grows faster in x. So this is, the graph of this, this is f, there's y, there's x. Um, or the contour graph, These are supposed to get closer together. These are the contours. So this is x, this is y. And the statement says that if I take any one of these level sets here, which I've corrected down here, or I take this curve here, and I take any point in that level set, so as long as we're not at a point where the gradient is zero, the gradient here is perpendicular. Or the gradient here, this is really the same picture, is perpendicular to that level set. Now, if we are in the case of a higher dimension, <coughs> say I'm, I have a three-dimensional thing, Then these level curves, maybe, well, this one's a sphere. These level curves will be spheres, right? So here, I can't draw this graph, but I can sort of draw, well, I can't even draw that. Just, you should imagine concentric spheres here. 
So any one of these spheres is a level curve. And I have a level curve, I have level surfaces. Right? So in this case, Uh, maybe I should have done something that wasn't closed. Oh well, too bad. Um, F of x, y, z equals constant. So I'll get a, a series of concentric spheres like that. And the gradients will be perpendicular to these spheres. So here this S is one of those. So imagine, you know, a little patch here of this sphere. On that patch, the gradient points away from that patch. And it's perpendicular. So, so how would we prove that? Yeah. Uh, so what we could do is say, um, whenever we got a vector, we could find the directional derivative of something by dotting mm -hmm. a vector with a gradient. Mm -hmm. Right, but we want the direction that we headed for the change to be zero, right? Because we don't want to go up and down or on a contour line. Yes. So in order for that to happen, we need something perpendicular to the gradient. Um, for the direction to be perpendicular to the gradient. Okay. And uh, because the only that's the only way that the dot product will be zero. Yes. So that's why the gradient is always perpendicular to the contour. Okay. You're, I mean, you're sort of justifying the converse, but yeah. Right. So the, I mean, it's it's. I mean, intuitively, intuitively, it's just that you know, if I have a level set like that, and the, that means this is the direction of no increase, and so the direction of maximal increase should be as quickly as you can get away from it. Great. Now, in this case, let me not draw the sphere. Let me just draw a piece of the surface where I have a level surface. So there's a piece of a level surface. So here, this is f of x, y, z is some constant. Then the gradient has to be perpendicular to this. So that means that, what does that mean? That means that if I take the tangent plane to this level surface, the gradient dotted with everything in the tangent plane will be zero. But it's maybe easier, instead of thinking about the tangent plane, because then we have to worry about tangent planes and so on, is take any curve that lives in the surface. So this is some curve. Gamma, which lives in certain lives in the surface. And S. Right, so if I take any curve so that this gamma of T satisfies F of gamma is a constant. Is this clear what I mean? I'm seeing a little bit of blankness here. People understand what I'm doing? No? OK. So I have here some level surface. Here it is. And I want to prove that the gradient vector is perpendicular to this surface. But rather than trying to approximate this surface by something else, the statement which is completely equivalent is, i draw it on this side so I can write on it, here's my surface. No matter how I travel around in the surface, there's a tangent vector associated with that, and that tangent vector will be perpendicular to the gradient vector. That's the statement that, that I'm claiming here. So we take gamma to be some so gamma here is some function from r to rn, which is my curve. And if it satisfies this, then that means that it's 
It's like one of these squiggly lines. It lives inside my surface because my surface is defined to be the stuff so that f is evaluated at that point is that constant, whatever that constant is. Okay? And so now I can prove this. just by showing that the gradient of f, so I take some point, so let's assume that gamma of t naught is x naught, and the gradient of f at this point x naught, this pin is failing, um, dotted with uh, the tangent to gamma is zero. So if I have that, then that means, so that means that at x naught, the gradient is perpendicular to the tangent to <coughs> gamma. So it's exactly you know, this picture. Here's my surface with its curves in it, and here the gradient goes this way and the tangent vector goes that way. That's the wrong set of notes. Cool. Um, and so, so but well, we've, we've sort of set all of this up already. We can just look at, call this H, I can still call it H. H is F of gamma of T. I guess there's a T here. And this needs to be, a, this is a constant. Right, if I compose F, with gamma, well, gamma is this curve that flies around in the level surface, and everywhere on this level surface, f is some constant, let's call this constant just c. So this is some constant c. And now we can just take the derivative. So if we take the derivative of this equation, so h prime, of t, forget about this for a minute, is the derivative of c, which is 0, because it's a constant derivative, a constant is 0, but also it's the derivative of this, f of gamma of t. And that we did last time. That's the gradient. So it's the derivative of the outside function, which is the gradient of f evaluated at the inside function, dotted with the derivative of the inside function. This is the tangent vector. And this is the gradient. And this is 0. So just by using the chain rule that we wrote last time, because I have exactly this setup, right? I have gamma takes R into Rn, and I have F, which takes Rn into R. And last time we talked about the composition going that way, from R to R. We wrote a chain rule for such a composition. Okay? Any questions on that? All right. So let me um, come back now to gradient vector fields at least for a minute or so. I guess I didn't leave them. So these are particularly important Okay. 
in areas like physics and, and so on. Um, a, a gradient vector field, this means that I have a vector field. I just wrote it over there, didn't I? Well, I'll write it again. It's a vector field which is a gradient, so let's call it F, big N, let's say from Rn to Rn, which is the gradient of some little f from R to R. And geometrically, this just well, I'm going to write it as a negative. So this vector field, I'm going to write it, corresponds to, I guess I'll write it as flowing uphill. If I have some surface some surface like that, then if I look at if I look at the contour, the contours of this, this will look something like, well here, this point will correspond to a high point. This would be another high point here. Here, here, my contour lines are going to be like circles or maybe ellipses. This point here corresponds to a point there, which is where the two ellipses come together. And then my contour lines are something like that. Right, so this is my graph. I didn't put coordinates in here, but x, y, z, and this is my graph in x, y plane, the contours of that. And my gradient vector field, maybe I'll use red, is going to be perpendicular to this. I guess up is towards the dots here, the way I drew it. So my vector field here is going to flow inward, perpendicular to this. something like that, so it'll be a vector field like that, which corresponds to, so let me just take a particular line here, corresponds to always moving uphill as much as you can. Or more naturally, if you take the negative gradient, that'll be like you poured water on top and watch how the water goes down. Right, so I was going to change the sign and look at negative the gradient, which is flowing downhill. But so in physics and in many applications, this function f is called a potential function. So a gradient vector field means that you have some potential, and the gradient vector field is the vector field that corresponds to the gradient of that potential. And these level curves that I drew are lines where the potential is constant. And then we can have, I had green, went away. There it is. These solution curves that I'm drawing, something like this. So this, this is following the flow lines here. Uh, well, that would correspond to something like this one that I did there. So that's a solution curve to this different, to this vector field. A vector field corresponds in some, some very explicit sense to a differential equation here in the plane. And these solution, these, these flow lines here, so also one often uses the word flow instead of vector field. <coughs> So these lines here, which correspond to the curves which are tangent to the gradient, to the vector field, are called solution curves or flow lines. And they're sort of 
uh, solutions of the differential equation of the of the vector field. Uh, so I just wanted to say a couple of words about that. We will definitely come back to looking at these kinds of vector fields later in like a month or maybe a little less, maybe a couple of weeks. Um, not just gradient ones, but ones which are not gradients. So this, this is sort of like integration in the single variable case, right? The vector field is a way of specifying something about the derivatives, finding these curves. Sometimes it's called finding an integral uh, or solving the, the flow. So there's a, a close relationship there. Um, and also in 308, there's some fair amount of attention paid to that. Or 303, if you take the Yeah? The potential function is a function, which, I mean, you may not have an explicit formula for the function, but it is a function. So, for example, in, you know, you might have potential energy. And so the energy is, can be conserved, in which case you move on, on level curves of the potential. What is the intuition of the potential? Well, do you want intuition like physics, like physics <coughs> intuition? Well, I don't know about this specific one. Uh, I guess, I guess if I flip it over, if I if I make it these are these are down rather than up, then I could have two attracting, could have two gravity wells, and 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 then you know I could have. This attracts stuff, and this attracts stuff, and then you tend to go this way. So in this case, this this potential could represent the the potential um, of two mutually orbiting planets, and there is a point just between them where you exactly balance out, but it's quite unstable. If you move a little bit, you'll fall into the orbit of the other guy. I mean, there's there's lots of applications here, right? So I, you can imagine that, well, instead of putting it in a rotating coordinate system, so I have a planet here, and I have a planet here, stuff near this planet just crashes into it. But, but you know, there is a place where far away you'll come in, and then you're just to one side or the other, so you go that way. That's exactly this kind of effect. But, you know, in general, potential can represent anything. Okay. Um, yeah, it's also, it can be the height of the surface. Okay. Um, okay, so I want to come back to put vector fields away a little bit. come back to chain rule. So we have a chain rule already. So we already developed a chain rule. Well, we certainly have the chain rule for this situation where we have R to R. We have this one from the old days. And then we also have this one. Oh, that's a one. We also have this, and we want to get that's a G. Right? This is the one where we take the gradient and dot it with with the derivative of F. This one is just right. So let's call this H. So here. We have D D T of H of T is who's on the inside? G. G prime F of T times F prime of T. And here, again, it's a single variable. D D T H of T is the gradient of G evaluated at F times the tangent 
and that needs to be a dot product. And this is a tangent. But, you know, we want more generally, we put in Rn, we go to Rm, and then we go to Rp. So we want this. So we want to write a general k rule in, in, any, in any dimension. Now sometimes you have to be, let me just point out, we have to be, and I'm going to be, well, we have to be a little careful about domains sometimes. Good question? Okay. Okay. So we have to be a little careful about the domain when we're doing compositions. We have to have the same kind of care here, but we can have the situation where, say, f is defined on some blob here. Uh, and so this is the domain of f. And it goes by f to something. And this is in, so in this case, this is in Rn. This is in Rm. And maybe the domain of G doesn't include that whole thing. And so G only makes sense here. So this is the image of that. And so, uh, well, this will go into P. And so the composition, obviously, only makes sense on this overlap, which means it only makes sense on part of the domain of F. Right? So sometimes you have to be a little bit careful to, to figure out where, so maybe G takes its domain onto some blob, and then this image is just going to be here. We can only make sense of the composition. Where it's defined. Right? So you have you sometimes have to take care. But it's well, I don't know. When you have more variables, it's easy to lose track of that. I just want to point out, not to pay attention to the domain. Um, now, we already have a situation where we know what the chain rule should be in this, in this set. Um, and that's the case where where f is a linear function and g is a linear function. We already know how that works. So if f and g are linear, that is, f is some matrix, so let's say f of my x vector is some matrix a times x, so in this case, A would need to be, who is which? M by N? And G is some other matrix. Did I get it backwards? No, P by, P by M, right? In this case, what is df? What is the derivative of f? Huh? It's just the matrix A. It's actually just f function. 
Right? And here, dg is just the matrix B. And the chain rule is just multiply the matrices. Right, the composition, composition here, G of F of X is just, well, first I compute AX and then I compute B of that. And the derivative of this composition is just makes its multiplication. So there's like nothing interesting here. Um, and this is actually how it works in general. So we already saw, so in the case of, in the case of linear f and g, the derivatives are just matrices. The composition just corresponds to multiplying the, multiplying the matrices. And there's really nothing to do. Um, and that's how it works in general, because we already know that the derivatives are matrices. So. So the chain rule is not part. Um, so in general, I want to use a condition. I don't think I need it. Continuous differentiability with the part of one. Okay. So suppose I have the situation. Um, F takes Rn to Rm, and G takes Rm to Rt, and both, and let's take X0 in Rn. So that's my setup, and I'm going to assume here that the composition, so, so I need F to be continuously differentiable, which means it's differentiable with the mixed partials equal. Continuously, diff or the partials are continuous, same thing. Continuously differentiable near x0. And I need g to be continuously differentiable near f of x0. And I need the composition G composed with F to be defined on some region around it. In other words, you know, I need this situation where X0 is say in here. F of X0, and then I can come over to G of F. Okay? So if I have that, then, no surprise, the composition is continuously differentiable near x0. That's one fact. And furthermore, the derivative It's just the product. Uh, so it's the derivative of G. I guess I want to turn it into a matrix. So I evaluate it at F of X naught. And I multiply it in the matrix C way by the derivative of F. Evaluate. So the chain rule just works in the same way, provided that you remember that everything inside is a matrix. 
and you multiply matrices. And one sloppiness that you can do in single variable calculus is you can take the derivative of the inside function first and then multiply it by the derivative of the outside function that won't necessarily work here. Right? It may not even make sense because the dimensions may be wrong and we can't multiply the matrices together. But even if n equals m equals p, these two matrices might not be equal. So it's important that we do this one first. Right? So maybe I should do an example. And I have an example that I worked out. So I should do it. Oh, I did the proof first. Let me do the proof first. So the proof is just stupid. <laughs> the proof is just write everything down. Sure enough, it works. <laughs> Do you want me to write it down? Awesome. See that it works? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, so the proof is you write down the derivative matrix of G. So I guess here I'm going to put everything in coordinates. So in coordinates, I'm going to assume, let's see, G is x1 up to xm. So the derivative of G will be the partial, not of F, of G. G1 with respect to, let's call that Y, Y1 evaluated at, I'm going to, so I'm going to just call this Y. So Y is F of X naught. Because I don't want to keep writing it. So I take that and I plug in partial of G1, G1 with respect to Y2 at y, blah, 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 dg1 with respect to y, uh, m, blah, 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 dg1, g, p with respect to y, m, dg, p, with respect to ym. So that's dg, df, same nonsense with different letters, df1 with respect to x1, at x1, at x, blah, 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 df, n, n, <coughs> 1 with respect to xn, at x, blah, 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 df, M with respect to X1, DF, M with respect to XN. So there's the two derivative matrices. So I write them down. Uh, I guess I multiply them there. Actually, I'm not going to multiply them. Let's just look at what the IJ guy looks like. So if I look at the product, dg, df, and pull out the ij entry, then this is just a sum, right? So to get ij, I take the i throw here and the i throw there, and I'm going to get just the sum, df, oh no, 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 g, G I, so I'm going to sum over K, D uh, Y K evaluated at Y times D F K D X J evaluated at X. Right? So the entry, when I multiply these together, the entry in the ij place is just the product of the i row times the j column. So that's just the dot product of what? Well, the i row 
is the gradient of G I evaluated and I guess I was calling it Y Y and I'm dotting that with um, the tangent vector uh, yeah so let me write that as F K prime Right, I'm fixing this variable, and I'm getting this column, it's giving me a tangent vector in of fk in the x direction. Right, this is the tangent in the direction, so this is the tangent to the curve fj of x, where I'm thinking of x as being fixed in all directions but one. This is really that's j. Well, okay, but that's a thing we saw before. So this is the partial of g Right, y, this is, y is f of x. So that's just the partial of gi composed with f with respect to x. j, I can never keep track. Yes, evaluated at x. Because it's just the derivative there with respect to xj. So that's it. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> for the chain rule of the matrices, it's is every gradient dotted with every tangent? Yeah. Well, every tangent in each direction. Okay. Right? You have a lot of tangents. So you take each coordinate and you dot it with the tangent in that coordinate direction. But I mean it's it's easier just to write down. So let's do an example. Uh, so what did I do? So f of x, let's do a 2 by 2. f of x, y is x squared plus y squared. Let's write it this way. Um, x squared minus y squared. This one should be this way. And g, uh, not of x, y, and u, v. Uh, what did I do? U, v, u plus. Um, okay, and let's let's compute. Well, okay, so D G is the matrix. Well, I take the partial here with respect to everything in sight. So the derivative of this with respect to u is v. <coughs> the derivative of this with respect to v is u. The derivative of this with respect to u is 1. The derivative of u with respect to v is 1. So there's dg. And df. I take the derivative of this with respect to x gives me 2x. With respect to y, I get 2y. With respect to x, I get 2x. With respect to y, I get minus 2y. And let's compute the product at a point. So let's just compute the derivative of the composition at the point. Uh, what did I do? One, two. The book does two, one. Right? They use the same example, but they do two, one. Okay, so what do I need? I need to first figure out what is f of one, two, because I'm going to need to know what v and u are. Right, so when x is one, y is two, then that tells me that u is two, 
and v is uh, negative 3. Right? In other words, f of 1, 2, why did I get 5 before? Because it is, I can't add 5. <laughs> is 5, negative 3. Right? 2 squared is usually 4 and not 1. Okay, so now I can just plug in here and see that dg at the point I care about, 5, negative 3, is the matrix negative 3, 5, 1, 1, and df at the point 1, 2 is 2, 4, 2, negative 4. And the product, this is this matrix times this matrix. So that's negative 6. Wait a minute. Yeah, negative 6 minus 10 is 4. Yeah, I got 4 last time too. Good. Negative 6 minus 10 is 4. And negative 12 minus 20 is negative 32. And 2 plus 2 is 4. And 4 minus 4 is 0. Right? Any, any question about that? Yeah. So the first one you did like negative here? So negative, yeah, for, for the first term in the matrix. Uh -huh. You did negative three times. This times two. this. Right, it's the row times the column. Okay. So, so that'll be negative six minus negative six plus ten. Okay, and then you did minus six. Well I wrote four. I made you say minus. So this is negative six plus ten. Which is four. It's the same four that I wrote before. Yeah. yeah. But that's what it is. And that minus 32 is not part of it. Okay, so that's, and that's the same derivative I got in my office, so that's good. Um, means I can do it the same way twice. Doesn't mean I can do it right. Um, okay. So, let's try. This is really getting scummy. Um, let's do another example. Um, suppose, uh, what did I do? u squared plus v cubed, y is e to the uv, x is <coughs> no, u. U is t plus 1, v is t to t. So uh, what's the composition I'm doing here? So I want to find, so I'm actually doing this guy first and this guy second. So I can, so the composition will be, wait a minute, didn't I already do that? No. Right. Um, so I want to find dx, dt, and dy, dt, and uh, t equals 0. Okay? So I'm going to start here with t equals 0. I will take, so that means that uv is 1, 1. So I take this, plug it into that. Now, of course, I could just do the composition and then take the derivative, but let's do it the matrixy way. I mean, you can do it both ways, of course, but here. So I'm going to call this map um, so I have the situation F takes R to R2 and then I get it with some g that takes R2. So this is F. Um, no. This is F of T. And this is T. Yes. G. Okay, 
and here, well, okay. So I can either not do it at t equals zero. Let's do it at t equals zero. Where it's straight. Um, okay, so I just need to write down dg at, at t equals zero is just g is here. Who's on the outside? G is on the inside. Um, so let's do df first. df is 1 e to the t. And dg is 2u 3v squared um, v e to the u u e to the v. I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Those are both UVs. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so those are the two, two guys I get. And at t equals 0, so df 0 is just 1, 1. And dv of 1, 1. Why didn't I have a 2 before? Okay, doesn't matter. Is 2, 3, 1, 1. And so now when I take their product. Oh, I see. I didn't do it. It's not 1, 1. It's E. Those are E's. Yeah. Much better. E. Uh, Actually, let's do it in two ways. So let's find it in general. And at t equals 0. So at t equals 0, I can just take the product of those two matrices, which gives me 1, 1, 2, 3, E, E, which is 5, 2, E. So that means dx dt is 5, dy dt is 2e. At t equals 0. If I want to do it in more generality, so let's just write in general what dx dt and dy dt are, then I use the unevaluated matrices. So dx, dt, and dy, dt will be 1 e to the t times 2u, 3v squared, v e to the uv, u e to the v, uv, which is 2u plus v e to the u v and what? What is v to the t? The second term e to the What did I? What did I just do? Yeah. Okay. So I. Oh, so it's not. What am I doing? I want. I want the row. I'm so stupid. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, did I just get them backwards? So, yes. I sure did, didn't I? Yeah. No, G's on the... Yes. G's so this is also wrong. Yeah. But I get the same answer. Yeah. Well, that's probably perfect. Because it's like one one, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, okay. That's why it doesn't make any sense. That's much better. So it gives me 2U plus 3V plus 3V e to the t and V e to the u v plus u e to the t plus u. Right? Now, here I have t's and u's mixed. So if you don't want to mix t's and u's, then you can plug in. Uh, uh, that u is t plus 1. Uh, 
v was e to the t. So that's e to the t squared, which is e to the 3t. And here, this is v is e to the t. V is e to the t, so this is uh, e to the t, e to the t plus 1 e to the t. And this is, so that's really t plus 2. And this is u is t plus 1 e to the, where did it go? t plus u v. t plus t plus 1. Kind of a mess, but you know, we can do that. Okay? Um, and one can just do that. So I'm not going to do these all day long. It's a dull. So let's move on. So any questions about this? Yeah. Is that more human church to understand this? Sure. So so what is this saying? This is saying I have some. Let me just draw it in terms of boxes. So I have some box here, which I apply my inner function is f or g. I guess I do f first. And it gives me something. <coughs> OK. And at this point, where I'm looking at, locally, f is some, they're at very near this point, the image here. F is some kind of, let me draw it as a parallel, some kind of linear stretch and compress. It's a matrix. So it's some kind of linear M. Okay, so let me give you the geometric definition in one variable, and then you'll see it's the same. So in one variable, <coughs> I have, I put in, some intervals, some region, and the graph of F has some slope here. Well, that's another way of saying that near this point A, so I'm just thinking about the derivative at a single point. Near this point A, I can also think of F as taking This is slope m. Slope is n. Near this point a, it takes the line and stretches it by a factor of m. So f, I'm going to draw it not like a graph, but I'm going to draw it just like a line. It takes a to f of a. But it takes points near a, at least on a small scale, points which are stretched out by a factor of m. Here m is like 2. Okay. So it's stretched by a factor of m. G does a similar thing. If I take my little ruler here based at f of a, and I have my, my little ruler, which has already been stretched, or maybe it hasn't been stretched. G has some derivative, so, so this is f prime, okay? G has some derivative, so I apply g here. And it stretches by some other factor, q. So here, let's say maybe it's some kind of, well, I'll just stretch it again. So g prime of f of a is multiplication by some number q. So this will stretch this stretching again by another factor times q. Okay? So the composition, well, if I first stretch by a factor of m and then I stretch by a factor of q, I can just go directly stretching by a factor of m times q. Okay? The same thing happens. <coughs> Now here I'm not going to even bother to draw the graph. 
The same thing happens when I have, so let's say I have some grid here, and I'm going to do it near zero just because it's easier to draw. I apply F to this, and at least on a very small scale, F looks like multiplication by a matrix. So F, so DF is some matrix A. And that means on a very small scale, this grid is going to be as though I acted on it by some matrix A, which is maybe going to compress and shear a little bit and get something like this. That's the action of multiplying this grid, applying A to this grid. And again, it sends the center spot to the center spot. Um, if I drew a new grid here, and I apply G to it, well, G is going to be just like DG is like acting by a matrix B. And so that's going to take this green grid and do something to it. Maybe it's going to, I don't know, just rotate. So it rotates the grid like this. And now if I just look at the, the, the black grid inside the green grid, it gets rotated even more and compressed like that. And the composition here, so this is, so dg is some b. The composition is just squish the thing and then turn it. Now, if the functions aren't linear, it doesn't matter because derivatives are the linear approximations to the function. So that means as long as I look really close to this point, I can't tell the difference, or I can only approximately tell the difference, between the linear function, which is the derivative, and the actual function, which is the function. So I will have a different factor at different points, which is what all of this craziness is, is to account, you know, here, sorry, here, I just got numbers. I just got linear maps. That's because I was looking at one point. But if I look at a different point, I get a different linear map. Here, I get a whole collection of linear maps, each different at different points. And you could put them all together and get some kind of a function, but I'm thinking just of acting at a point. It's linear. It does some squishing. It does some stretching. It does a little twisting, whatever. And so the composition is just do the squishing and the stretching and then do the twisting and the squishing and all of those things one after the other. So that's the geometric intuition, which is exactly the same as the calculation. The calculation is just writing down how much I squished by, how much I twisted by, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Are you all right with this? Okay. Now, so far, so let's just continue that sort of a story. Um, I mean, in fact, this, this matrix was, was singular. Uh, suppose that, I, that my matrix, let's just take a, a two by two case, DF, so I'm not talking about the chain rule at the moment, I'm just talking about a derivative. What if the derivative at some point is a singular matrix like 1, 1, well, let's not do that. About 1, 0, 0, 0. So this is not invertible. What does this say? <coughs> What does this say about F near P? So if I draw the picture with the box, 
This is on a very small scale. There's P right in the middle. I apply F or DF. What's the image of that box under that matrix? Yeah. Right, it's just a line, and so the x-axis, the x-direction is completely preserved, the y-direction is killed. So all the stuff in the y gets smashed to this line. So it's, it's singular in this direction. And of course, if I put some other stuff here, so if I do something like, you know, 1, 1, or 1, 2, 0, 0, then instead of being just smashed onto that line, I'll be smashed onto the line <coughs> of slope 2, but still I'm smashed in some direction here. If I have more dimensions, I might be compressed in other, you know, dependent. So if the, sorry. If, so that's saying, so this is saying if the determinant of df is zero, that means the matrix is not invertible, then that means that I'll have a problem. Something gets smashed. So if the determinant is zero, that means there's going to be some direction, maybe a whole line of direction. This doesn't mean it's going to drink a lot. It's going to get compressed. I'm going to lose a dimension, maybe several dimensions. Yeah, I'll have drunken function. Um, so, let's stay away from that situation for a moment. So, if the derivative is not zero, if the, if the matrix is invertible, then that means from this picture, I can undo the action. Right? If near my point P, my matrix is invertible, then I can instead start with this black thing and unstretch it. So if the determinant not zero, this means I have an inverse matrix. So near the point P, uh, F of P, I can invert. This is exactly the same as the one variable statement that says that if, so I have y equals f of x, and here, if f prime of x is not 0 and it's defined, then I can solve locally anyway, x equals f, uh, not f, how about f inverse y. Yeah? Uh, in this sense, is inverting like analogous to integrating at that point? No. It's finding the, it's, 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 so, so here, right, in the one variable case, let's just focus on the one variable case for a second. So in the one variable case, I have y equals x squared. And if I choose so near x equals minus 1, y equals 1, I know that x is the square root negative of y. I have an inverse function. So that's what I mean by inverse. So I have y equals x squared, and so here's negative 1. Huh? 
Did I do it wrong? Okay. So here, there's a branch of the square root. This is just a function. If I sort of lay on my side, uh, add the other one. That. Right? So here I can take this branch of the inverse and everything's okay. I need to know which of the two pieces I'm on, but as long as I just look around here and stay away from zero, I have an inverse function. And I can write a formula for it. I can't always write a formula, but I always have an inverse as long as I stay away from the place where the derivative is zero. Notice that near, near uh, x equals zero, so I have a problem. Uh, f prime of x equals zero, and I can't make an inverse because I don't know which side to choose. I have to take both. So plus or minus square root x, this is not a function. Because the derivative is zero here, I don't have an inverse. Now maybe if the derivative is zero, I can still make stuff work because maybe if you think about the example of the cube root, I'm okay. Right, with, with the cube. So this is sufficient but not necessary. Uh, <coughs> if my function is y equals x cubed, things are still okay. I still have the ability to take a cube root. So this is f, this is f inverse, I'm okay. But if the derivative is not zero, for sure everything's okay. And the analog here is the same. If the determinant is not zero, the determinant of the derivative is not zero, wow, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm waving high. If the determinant of the derivative is not zero, then I have an inverse. If it is zero, probably I don't have an inverse, maybe kind of, sort of, unless I'm lucky. So let me write that as a, as a theorem. Uh, I don't need anything there. Okay. So this is called the inverse function theorem. Yes. First function theorem says that uh, if f from r n, well, in order for the determinant to be non-zero, I kind of need it to be the same dimension. Um, uh, so this is continuously differentiable is continuously differentiable near some point P and uh, the determinant of the derivative at P is non-zero, then Wait a minute. Can I go one way? Um, yes. So then, wait a minute. Well, okay, I'll write it this way. Then, then there exists uh, some function f uh, near f of p. So in some neighborhood of, of p. I guess I'll draw the picture here. Right, I have, I have my point P sitting in Rn here in some region where F is nice. F sends it over here to F of P. So then there's some region near here where I can go back by big F, which I'll call F inverse. F 
F and F. We have an inverse function here. And furthermore, uh, derivative d big F at P is the inverse, let me write it this way, of d little f. This is the f. <coughs> so the inverse matrix, the, if I write down the, the matrix of the derivative, the inverse of that is the inverse of the derivative. Uh, I was going to do some examples and I was going to do the implicit function theorem, but it seems I won't. Okay.